after just over 500 hours on Baldur's Gate 3, I can confidently say that this Ballas variation of the Bardadin is the best build in the game. And I know that term gets used quite liberally. I, I know that every build on YouTube is the best build in the game. And although there are builds with better damage profiles, arguably so, like the Open Hand Monk, or the Gloomstalker Assassin, uh, even just any Sorcerer variation. Holistically, I don't think there's any other build in the game that has the damage profile of a Bardadin with the same out-of-combat versatility and group utility. Even though we're building a conventionally damage-oriented build in the Swords Bardadin, we maintain some of those really important and beneficial group party buffs such as a long strider to increase everyone's movement speed by a noticeable amount. Enhance ability, which grants advantage on ability checks of a corresponding ability. Speak with animals so that you don't have to make a dice roll with Scratch to be rewarded sandals. Hey, I do not care. And most importantly, the Song of Rest, which grants you three short rests per long rest. When it comes to selecting a race, you've got a few options. The Wood Elf and the Wood Half Elf stand out as some of the more consistent and safe picks. The increased mobility is fantastic for us as we're a melee class. They have relevant proficiencies, relevant skills, dark vision, and advantage on saving throws against being charmed. Being charmed is going to be a common affliction in boss fights in the latter portions of Act 2 and Act 3, so it's always nice to have. Another great candidate to host the Bardadin is going to be the Halfling. Their lucky passive is especially valuable to us because this build will quickly scale to a point where the only way it can miss both attack and ability checks is by critically missing. So having a racial passive that further mitigates our only potential for missing, especially over the accrual of many many dice rolls, which most likely the Bard will be doing as it's going to be your face character, is extremely valuable and makes Halfling a very, very strong candidate. In terms of just damage output, the best race is going to be the Half-Orc. And that's not to say that Relentless Endurance isn't great durability, it is. It's a fantastic contingency, especially in Honor Mode. We're a melee class, we are inevitably going to take damage. Relentless Endurance can save an Honor Mode run entirely by itself. But the real value of the Half-Orc in terms of damage output is Savage Attacks. For all intents and purposes, this is a crit fishing build, so when the build is fully realized in Act 3 in terms of equipment and gear, our critical hit range will be so low such that we are critting on just about every other melee weapon attack. If I were to read Savage Attacks as you deal an extra dice of weapon damage on every other melee weapon attack, it pulls away from the other races by a pretty glaring margin just in terms of damage output. The bottom line is that you should play whatever you want to play from a role-playing perspective. Every single race in this game fulfills some form of niche and they have passives that you can use to justify playing that race, um, except maybe the Dragonborn. So just go ahead and pick whatever you want to. Is the political answer. The correct answer for the best race to play the Bardadin with is Astarian. There are many ways to go about leveling this build. It's tempting to start out as a Paladin, maybe take another level into Paladin, and only then take 10 levels into Swords Bard. That way you start the game with heavy armor proficiency, relevant saving throw proficiencies, as well as Divine Smites already at level 2. I'd recommend against that leveling curve. For one, Bards already have their Martial Extra Attack delayed by one turn. Instead of the normal level 5 where Martial Classes get their Extra Attack, Bards get it at level 6. At level 5, Bards have their Bardic Inspirations refreshed on short rest as opposed to long rest. So Bard level 5 and Bard level 6 are huge power spike levels that we want to hit as early as possible. 
Although the heavy armor proficiency would be nice, and Divine Smite is definitely great for our damage output, starting the game off as a Paladin and taking two levels into Paladin, it, it just delays our other power spike levels by way too much to consider taking Paladin first. So in this video I'll be starting out as a Bard, taking six levels of Swords Bard, and then the minute we hit level 7, I'm going to go respec to restart as a Paladin, and then take six levels of Swords Bard, a second Paladin level at level 8, and then Swords Bard for the rest of the game. So at level 1 we start out as a Bard. You can pick any two cantrips you want. Mage Hand is always great and has out of combat utility as well as in combat utility. Vicious Mockery is not too bad, although we will be a martial class. We are a hybrid caster, yes, but you want to be expending your resources on flourishes, mobile range attacks. Generally, you do not want to be spellcasting in combat. For our spells, I always take Long Strider and Speak with Animals. There's cases to be made for Tasha's Hideous Laughter, there's cases to be made for Dissonant Whispers. Both have situational uses, as does Fairy Fire and Thunder Wave. So feel free to pick any other two combinations of spells for the last two slots. For starting instrument, pick whatever you want. That's to your flavor. For our ability scores, we're going to put two into Dexterity and put a plus one bonus into Charisma. Dexterity 16, Charisma 16, 14 Constitution, and the rest into Wisdom for Wisdom saving throws. There are two caveats to this stat distribution. One is that I always use Strength Elixirs in Act 1, and I highly recommend you to use Strength Elixirs in Act 1. Auntie Ethel sells 3 per long rest. Another way you can go about forcing the long rest is if you save level ups until you reach Auntie Ethel in the Emerald Grove. Every time you level up, her shop will refresh, so you can go to her, buy out her shop of 3 elixirs, level up, buy out her shop of 3 elixirs, and just constantly rinse and repeat until you have a sufficient amount of elixirs. This is because light weapons and finesse weapons that we'll be using dual wielding can scale with your strength instead of your dexterity if your strength is higher. The elixirs allow us to bring our strength higher than we could ever bring our dexterity in the first two acts of the game. For skill proficiencies, as this is always my face character, I usually go with the charisma based proficiencies. It's also a good idea to use acrobatics and athletics because again we will be a melee class. I find Persuasion to be the most common type of Charisma check in the game. You can take out Performance and Intimidation in favor of those. At Bard level 2 we get access to the Song of Rest and thus our third short rest per long rest. We also get another spell. Again these spells are not too valuable so just pick what you hadn't picked last time that best fits your party comp and utility needs. At Bard level 3 we get access to our subclass. For this build, we're going to be going with the College of Swords and finally have our most important offensive options in our Flourish attacks. The Flourishes are the reasons that we choose to use our Bardic Inspirations offensively rather than defensively or for out of combat utility. Whenever possible, you want to use your Bardic Inspirations on one of these following Flourishes. Slashing Flourish is perhaps our most important flourishing ability as it compensates for our delayed extra attack in giving us a pseudo extra attack, essentially letting us hit three enemies a turn, once with our main action on a Slashing Flourish and once with our offhand bonus action. Another important thing to mention is that although the tooltip of Slashing Flourish ranged says that you can attack up to two enemies at once, you can actually use both shots on the same enemy. We also get access to our fighting style. We're going to go with two weapon fighting, as in holding a dagger or a light sword in each hand. We also get access to another spell. Enhance ability is one of our most important spells and makes it so that ability checks are practically impossible to miss from this point onwards, especially with all our proficiency bonuses. It lasts until long rest and although it requires concentration, it's a very versatile spell you can cast on yourself, on a party member. Overall, just one of our better utility spells. At Bard level 4, we get access to our first feat. There's only really two options, and one of which is just way better than the other one. We can either take an ability score and put both points into dexterity to increase our attack roll chance and our AC by one point, 
But as I said earlier in the video, you should be drinking strength elixirs at this point to where your strength will perpetually be 21, which is higher than 18 dexterity. So the attack rolls will be unaffected as your weapons will scale with your strength instead. And the 1 AC is relatively inconsequential at this point in the game. So I would recommend going for Savage Attacker. Savage Attacker is just going to allow us to roll our damage die twice when making attacks with our swords. Just a flat bonus uh, damage increase to our damage and it comes at no penalty unlike Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter. It's not something you have to play around, it's not something you have to think about. You just plug it in and you deal more damage as a result. We also get access to another cantrip. Again, just pick as you need at this point in the campaign. Another spell, as I've mentioned before, whatever you see fit. At Bard level 5, we finally hit one of our really important power spike levels. Bardic Inspiration is now reset on short rest as well as long rest, which is just fantastic for our action economy. Your Bardic Inspiration is also improved to a 1d8 instead of a 1d6. This is relatively unimportant because as I mentioned, because we're a Swords Bard, you want to be using your Bardic Inspirations on Slashing Flourishes or just Flourish Attacks in general rather than for out of combat ability checks. We also get access to another spell. These are more powerful than the ones we've been offered so far. Cliff of Warding, Hypnotic Pattern, and Plant Growth are all great CC choices. At Bard level 6, we finally get access to our Martial Extra Attack, which with the Swords Bard is more of a extra extra attack. You can now Slashing Flourish twice a turn, which hits up to 4 enemies, and then also you have your 2 weapon fighting offhand bonus action attack. So at Bard level 6, you become one of the better, if not best, two target cleave damage dealers in the entire game. You also gain another spell, again just pick one of the ones you hadn't picked before. Bard level 7 is the level where we're finally going to introduce Paladin into our build. But rather than adding Paladin by way of multi-classing, we're actually going to go to Withers, respect the entire build, and then start from Paladin. This will finally give us the heavy armor proficiency we were missing out on and slightly better saving throw con proficiencies. So we're gonna go to Withers, respect Paladin, start with the exact same stat distribution, and then put six straight levels into Swords Bard, picking everything the exact same as you've done to this point. Just to demonstrate the point, I've gone to Withers, respect myself, and I'm now starting from Paladin 1. We're going to choose the Oath of Vengeance, as we're only taking two levels into Paladin, so we're never going to get the actual subclass benefit. And the Oath of Vengeance Inquisitor's Might is going to be the best use of our Channel Oath charge throughout the game. It's just a tiny but nice damage bonus to our weapon attacks, dealing two Radiant damage. There's going to be enemies. When you reach this level, you are most likely going to be in Act 2, so a lot of the enemies are vulnerable to Radiant damage, so it's just nice to have. At total level 8, we're going to take our second and final level into Paladin. This will finally unlock our Divine Smites, which we should now take precedence for use of our spell slots. We can now Divine Smite enemies as a reaction after hitting them. We can smite both enemies we hit with a Slashing Flourish, meaning that in one turn without haste, we can actually deal 10 instances of damage. Two for the Slashing Flourish, which you can smite both, and again with your extra attack, you can smite both and once with your offhand, which you can also smite. So the damage of the build at this point is pretty much realized and should be pretty bonkers. In terms of fighting style, we're just gonna go with defense because we will be wearing heavy, heavy armor until we reach Act 3 and switch to the boss armor, which is still considered an armor piece. So it's just a flat, nice plus one bonus to our armor class. None of the other fighting styles have any sort of relevance or use for our build. In terms of which spells to prepare, I would just prepare all the smiting types, Thunderous, Searing, Wrathful, Bless is a great buff, so I would prepare that, and then either Divine Favor, Protection from Evil and Good, or Command as a final utility spell. At level 9, and for every other level of this build, we're just going to go straight back into our Swords Bard. 
At level 7 bar, you don't really get anything that's too important. You get access to some situationally useful spells. But again, these are now 4th level spell slots, which are just way better used on smite damage. So although there are some interesting options like Dimension Door, like Freedom of Movement or Greater Invisibility, you really shouldn't be casting any of these spells or using your spell slots on anything but smiting. At level 10, we take our 8th level into Swords Bard and get our second feat. The choice for our second feat is a lot more ambiguous and up for debate than the choice for our first feat, which is unambiguously going to be Savage Attacker. You have a few options. One would be to take an ability improvement and put your dexterity up to 18 for a plus one bonus to your AC. The thing is, this should be inconsequential to your attack rolls. Again, your strength should always be higher than your dexterity by way of elixirs. If you either refuse to use elixirs or don't have enough by this point in the game, this actually could be a consequential choice for your attack rolls and make a difference in terms of hitting enemies. If you are, however, using elixirs, then this is definitely not the pick. One AC is not worth an entire feat slot. Another fantastic option, and probably the option I would go with, is Alert. Especially when you have a build that has the damage output potential that this build does, where fights can usually end before they even begin, going first is invaluable. It's probably one of the most important elements of this build. For that reason alone, I would value Alert a lot higher than I would value any sort of other like durable feat, like any of the Armor Masters, something like Lucky, to minimize your misses, maybe even athlete for mobility. So we're gonna go with alert. You gain access to another spell, but again, the best spell slot is a divine smite spell slot. So just pick whatever you want. The penultimate level 11, we put our ninth level into Swords Bard. Again, we're not offered much here. We're offered another spell. I mean, the, the best spell is definitely a divine smite. But ironically, Hold Monster is actually worth considering and even more worth casting. If you're able to land Hold Monster on any enemy, every subsequent attack roll made with them in melee range, which will always be in, is going to be a critical hit. The Smite also critically hits if your weapon attack roll critically hit. So this is one of the cases where I would say that this spell is actually worth taking and worth considering when in combat if you have a high spell save DC. And at the final level 12, we put our last level into Swords Bard and are given a few interesting options. One of the less interesting options is picking another cantrip. At this point, you've probably picked all the valuable cantrips, so this is just a filler slot. Again, we're offered another spell, and after having taken Hold Monster, there's no longer anything that is more valuable than a Divine Smite. So as always, just take whatever provides the best utility to your party comp. Magical Secrets, however, are some of the best spells in the entire game offered to the Bard at level 10. There are a ton of options here. I can make an entire video discussing which combination of two Magical Secrets is the most optimal or the best choices. I mean, there are so many choices here that it's going to vary based on your team composition, who you're fighting, who you've already fought. I'll just go over some generally great options. Haste is always fantastic. Up until this point, you've either had to rely on Potions of Speed, Scrolls of Haste, or someone else to cast Haste on you, maybe a Sorcerer with Twin Spell. So having one in your arsenal is really, really strong and valuable. This is a strong contender. Hunger of Hadar is one of the best spells in the game that I don't see get talked about enough. It almost makes it worth it to go straight Warlock or at least Warlock level 5. It can trivialize entire fights and is easily one of the best CC spells in the entire game. It's another strong contender. Counterspell is one of the strongest reactions you can take in a turn. You can completely nullify a really strong spell cast by the opponent, which also skips their turn, essentially another really strong candidate. Otherwise, I would just go for something like a combination of Haste and Hunger and Hadar, Haste and Counterspell. There's room to talk about and think about Banishing Smite. It's good, it does a lot of damage, but the thing is, you want to banish people to the Shadow Realm with your damage. You don't really want to banish them for two turns out of combat where you can't hurt them. You have enough damage that there shouldn't really be an enemy that is so threatening to you and your party that you have to get them out of combat for two turns. It's nice to be able to do this uh, as a ranged option. You also get this as a melee. The tooltip doesn't tell you that. 
But again, like I said, you deal so much damage that the Banishing Smite is just your Divine Smite. You don't really need to invest a 5th level spell slot to banish someone for 2 turns. You're also offered more skill proficiencies. I would just go for Persuasion and Sleight of Hand. They're by far two of the more useful abilities in the entire game. There's a lot of Persuasion checks in Act 3 that are pretty important. Illithid powers are usually supplementary, but there are two that I highly recommend you taking which are really well suited for this build. Those being Favorable Beginnings and Luck of the Far Realms. Favorable Beginnings makes it so that your first attack roll or ability check you make against any target gains a bonus equal to your proficiency bonus. In practice, this just means that the first attack roll you make against any target will be your most accurate and the first ability check you make against any target has the highest chance of succeeding. The attack roll portion of favorable beginnings is especially important as the first turn of your combat is usually the most important in terms of damage dealing. Luck of the Far Realms can convert any successful attack roll into a guaranteed critical hit as a reaction. Because favorable beginnings makes it so that your first attack roll is likely to land and therefore guaranteed to crit with Luck of the Far Realms, your Divine Smite will also subsequently crit. This pairing of Alitha powers is exceptionally strong at dealing a ton of damage to high priority targets such as bosses or spellcasters, even those crier type enemies that call reinforcements in that first invaluable turn of combat. After that, I would make my way down to Psionic Backlash and Call of the Weak. I know that going partial Alithid is a topic of discourse and discussion in the Baldur's Gate community. You either condemn it or you condone it. We 100% condone it on this channel, you always go partial Lithid, especially for melee builds. Fly just closes that disadvantage we have in comparison to range attackers way too much. We can seamlessly traverse through the three-dimensional battlefield. You don't have to jump to get to higher places anymore. You don't have to take fall damage to get to lower places. You can get to multiple pairings and groups of enemies within one turn. Whereas previously, just by way of dashing or walking, you could only really get to one, maybe two groups of enemies if you're lucky. If for nothing but fly, it's worth going partial with it. I know it's ugly. If you're on PC, there's mods to get around it. Fly is just way too important for this build not to consider taking. A quick note to mention before we move on to discussing the best in slot gear and equipment in all three acts. Regardless of what class or build you're playing, you should get in the habit of going to your reactions underneath your spellbook and manually turning on all of the reactions. Particularly for this build, as your spell slots increase in level, the game does not automatically turn on your higher level spell slots, so it's important to go to your reactions and make sure that all of your higher level divine smites for the higher level spell slots are turned on. It's also important to make sure that the ask prompt is turned on for all of your reactions. Not only do you want to exercise agency in terms of your resource management and not let the game make decisions for you as it will often make the wrong decision, but there's something to consider in conserving your higher level spell slots and higher level divine smites for critical hits on your melee weapons as opposed to just successful attack rolls. When you critically hit with your normal melee weapon attack roll, the reactive divine smite will also critically hit. That's not to say that you should only spend your higher level Divine Smites on critical hits, but there are certain ways in this game to guarantee critical hits, like the Luck of the Far Realms Elithid ability, like the Killer Sweetheart Ring, which I'm going to talk about in your Act 2 gear. So it's at least worth considering saving your highest level spell slot Smites on guaranteed critical hits, if not just regular Nat 20 critical hits. Let's talk about our best in slot gear. So for each one of these chapters, I'm going to be wearing what I think is the best combination of the available gear in each act. But because I know that some of the gear I'm going to be wearing only appears later in each act, I'm going to have alternatives in my inventory of gear pieces that you can wear from the same act that you can either use as placeholders 
to wear until you get the gear that I'm wearing on my character, or as interchangeable substitutes if you feel that they're better pieces of gear. So our best gear in Act 1, starting with the Haste Helm, you can get this from a chest in the middle of the Blighted Village. It's just really good for our movement speed and allows us to cover more ground in combat. The Adamantine Scale Mail Armor, you can craft this in the Grim Forge after defeating Grim. It's our best defensive option and the medium armor with the highest AC in Act 1. Specifically, the attackers can't land critical hits on the wearer tag will significantly reduce the amount of damage we're expected to take as a melee class. Next are the gloves of the Growling Underdog. This can be found in the treasury room behind Dror Ragslin in the Goblin Camp. Usually I would say that these are pretty underwhelming and too situational and too niche to consider using, but this build happens to be one of those situational niches where these actually have really good efficiency. Because we want to utilize Slashing Flourish as much as possible, we actually want to be surrounded by two or more foes in combat on a regular basis, which will then mean that we have advantage on our melee attack rolls on a regular basis, which is the most relevant in Act 1 where we're the most likely to miss. So these are actually a good choice for this build. The Disintegrating Nightwalkers, you can get these off of Nier in Grimforge. Again, it just synergizes with our Haste Helm. If we can move more, we want to be unimpeded by difficult terrains to make use of our movement speed. So. That and the short rest refreshing Missy Step are just nice for our mobility. For our necklace, the Periapt of Wound Closure, you can buy this off of Lady Esther and the Mountain Pass. It's just essentially the Relentless Endurance passive that Half Orcs gets. And like I mentioned in the race selection, it's a nice contingency and failsafe, especially for Honor Mode players. For our rings, it is the Strange Conduit Ring. You can find this in a chest in the Inquisitor's Room in the Crash. Concentration is a relatively easy requirement to satisfy. You can concentrate on Enhance Ability until Long Rest. I know you have scrolls of Detect Thoughts in your inventory. You can use those to concentrate throughout uh, the entire day and they will satisfy this condition. Or you can just pop haste before going into combat. For a similar reason, we have the Caustic Band. You can buy this off of Dareth Bone Cloak in the Mykonic Colony in the Underdark. Unlike the Strange Conduit Ring, the two acid damage is just applied passively to all of our weapon attacks and doesn't have a saving throw or a requirement. Not that the Conduit Ring has a saving throw, but it does have a requirement, whereas the Caustic Band just always works. The Caustic Band, you can honestly wear it until Act 3. Same with the Conduit Ring. So it, once you get these rings, you're pretty much set until you reach the end of the game. For our melee weapon options, we have the Short Sword of First Blood, which you can get from a Deep Gnome on the uh, Underdark Beach where the ship is that leads you to Grimforge. Pretty relevant enchant to have and deals a nice chunk of additional damage. Our best weapon in Act 1 is by far the knife of the Undermountain King. You can buy this from the Gith Trader inside Kreshulek. It's the only plus two weapon enchant, light weapon in Act 1, so it's great for our accuracy. And also the first instance of crit hit fishing or crit range reduction. Even though it's just by one point, it increases our chance to critically hit by a whole 5%. So now on every weapon attack, we have a 10% chance to critically hit. After getting the knife of the Undermountain King, you're going to realize just how much more you're critting and how much more of a difference that 5% is making. So this is the best weapon in Act 1, maybe even one of the best weapons in the game for this build. For our ranged option, because we are two weapon fighting, we want to use two hand crossbows as opposed to one longbow or crossbow. In Act 1, any hand crossbow plus one that you can find, any magic hand crossbow is just going to be your best choice. I also have the Fire Stoker equipped, and it's something to think about, but to be honest, I don't know how often enemies are burning targets, so I would just go for two hand crossbows to maximize my efficiency and accuracy. The Graceful Cloth, which you can buy from Lady Esther, is a nice bonus to our dexterity and to our accuracy if we're not using potions, but the base AC is a little too low. We become a little too susceptible to incoming damage. The Gloves of Power from the Goblin boss outside of the Druid Grove in that first Goblin fight, it's just okay. It's not better than the Underdog, but it's okay to wear until then. The Gloves of Dexterity, similar to what I was saying with the Graceful Cloth, if we're not using Elixirs of Strength, are actually probably better than the Gloves of the Growling Underdog. These you can buy from the Gith Trader inside the Kresh and should wear over the gloves of the Growling Underdog if you're not using Strength Elixirs to bring your Strength to 21. The Boots of Speed from the Poison Deep Gnome in the Mykonic Colony, these are just okay. Um, you really shouldn't be using your bonus action on Click Hails as we are two weapon fighting and you want to be using it on ranged or melee attacks. 
but it's okay for mobility. The speedy reply, which you can get from one of Rugon's dead members as he's fighting Flind, the boss knoll near Joaquin's Rest, is probably the other best light weapon in the game until you get the short sword of first blood, or sorry, in act one. So I'll just carry it until then. This is more of a meme pick and just more of a plea for Larian to introduce a sickle that is viable in this game because it would be the coolest looking light weapon. Unfortunately, it's just not really good. The Moondrop Pendant from the Salunite chest inside the Owlbear Cave. It's just a worse version than the Periapt, as when you're above 50% health, you essentially don't have a necklace slot, whereas the Periapt is always a nice, like, contingency. It's just okay. The Absolute Talisman dropped from Precess Gut inside the Goblin Camp. It's nice to be able to cast aid on yourself, even if you don't have the Absolute's brand. The Ring of Protection, a crest reward from handing Mole the Idol of Sylvanas, which you can do, by the way, after you've cleared the Goblin Camp so that it's not as volatile and they don't fight you to the death for doing it. It brings your AC to a really respectable 20 in Act 1. Crusher's Ring, dropped from Crusher the Goblin outside a Goblin Camp for some more movement speed. Or the Whispering Promise, giving you Bless if you drink a Healing Pot, you can do it before or in combat, or throw a Healing Pot, or just any, way, any other way you have of healing your teammates, it grants them Bless. It's a pretty strong ring, and should be kept on another party member if you're not wearing it. Only after hitting these critical upgrades in Act 2 did I decide that, yeah, this is probably the best build in the entire game. So in Act 2, we're going to switch over to the Dark Justice Year Helmet to get another point reduction to our critical hit range. This is going to increase our critical hit chance to 15% without advantage. We get the helmet at the end of the Sharn Trials in the Gauntlet of Shar. If you find that you are not obscured enough to solicit wearing the helmet, you can always switch back to the Grimskull helmet for a more defensive option. We finally get a cloak in the Cloaker Protection from Quartermaster Tali at Last Light Inn for just a nice plus one to our armor class and saving throws. We're going to change our armor to the heavy armor Dwarven Splint Mail. You're usually level 7 by the time you enter Act 2, meaning that you will have gone to Wither's Respect to start as a Paladin and gain the heavy armor proficiency. If for some reason you are not level 7 by Act 2 and therefore haven't done this, it's perfectly acceptable to just go buy the Yuan-Ti scale mail from Quartermaster Tali, wear it until you get the Dwarven Splint mail and therefore heavy armor proficiency. The Yuan-Ti is actually going to give you the same AC as the Dwarven Splint mail with, so it's a perfectly good substitution. You can get the Dwarven Splint mail from Land, Tarv, and Moonrise Towers. Unfortunately though, there is a caveat to buying this piece of gear. To gain access to Lantar's exclusive armory that sells both the Dwarven Splint Mail and our Best in Slot Sword in this act, you need to pass an insight check when speaking to Disciple Zarel that will reveal that she is nervous when talking about the Night Song. Upon passing this check, you can convince her to grant you access to Lantar's exclusive armory, but it's contingent on passing the inside check to notice it in the first place. This is a super important check. It, it, it gives us access to two of our better gear pieces. So to get this armor and the sword, you need to pass it. You can maximize your chance of succeeding this check by precasting enhanced ability on yourself for advantage on the wisdom ability checks, which is what insight is, and having a companion precast guidance on you. Only after you've cast these on yourself should you go speak to Disciple Zarel. Hopefully you pass. If you don't pass the check, you can just wear Kethric's armor instead of the Splint Mail as a replacement and use the Dark Justice Year Scimitar instead of the Render of Mind and Body, which is dropped by the rats in Shars Gauntlet. For our gloves, we're going to go with the Flawed Helldust gloves from Damon at Last Light Inn by giving him a piece of Infernal Iron for another 1d4 to our damage. For our boots, we're going to go with the Evasive Shoes, which is sold by Mattis at Last Light Inn for another plus 1 to our armor class. If you did pass the check, we get to buy the Render of Mind and Body. This weapon deals an additional 1 to 8 psychic damage when we attack with advantage. We will always be attacking with advantage, as we're also going to be buying the Risky Ring from the Drow Arage in Moonrise Towers. So we will always attack with advantage, meaning that our attacks are extremely accurate. We'll always deal an additional 1d8 psychic damage as a result. And then when we reach the Mind Flayer column in Act 2, we're going to pick up the Resonance Stone to grant us and everyone around us the Steeped in Bliss condition, giving them a vulnerability to psychic damage. So psychic damage is going to be doubled against anyone in radius of us. This combination of interactions and items are going to mean that we're always dealing 2 to 16 psychic damage with just this one weapon alone. Consider all our other damage riders. 
our gloves, Draconic Elemental Weapon Enchantment, Psionic Overload for another 2 to 8 Psychic Damage, the Strange Conduit Ring for another 2 to 8 Psychic Damage, your Divine Smites. This act is when this build goes nuclear, just insane in terms of damage output. We're going to continue with the Knife of the Undermountain King for the reduction to our critical hit range. You can wear the Subjugation Amulet dropped by Malice Thorm at the House of Healing. Although there's not that many humanoid targets in Act 2, so I would just recommend continuing to wear the Periapt of Wound Closure. For our rings, as I mentioned, we're going to be wearing the Risky Ring. I have the Strange Conduit Ring because of the interaction with Steeped in Bliss. Until you go to the Mind Flayer Colony, you can justify continuing to wear the Caustic Band for a guaranteed 2 acid damage. Or, once you fight your Illusory Copy at the self same trial at the Gauntlet of Shard, you can use the Killer Sweetheart for another guaranteed critical hit per long rest. For our ranged crossbows, we're just going to be introducing the Hellfire Hand Crossbow dropped by your gear to possibly inflict the burning status that is required for the Fire Stoker to deal an additional 1d4 piercing damage to said burning targets. So just another nice synergy between our gear pieces. There are a few other pieces of gear that I highly recommend you to obtain in Act 2, not to wear, but to use as abilities. These being the Gloves of the Automaton, sold by Barkus Root at Last Light Inn, which grants you advantage on all your attack rolls for 10 turns. The Drake Throat Glaive, sold by Roa Moonglow at Moonrise Towers, which gives any of your weapons a 1d4 of an elemental damage type of your choosing. The Darkfire Shortbow sold by Damon at Last Light Inn, giving you resistance to fire damage and cold damage, as well as a free haste once per long rest. And the Spellcrux Amulet, which allows you to restore a spell slot of any level dropped by the Prison Warden at Moonrise Towers. What I mean by using these gear pieces as abilities is to benefit from the abilities of these gear pieces without having to have them equipped. So for example, with the gloves of the automaton, if you put both the gloves of the automaton and the gloves you're currently wearing on your hotbar, switch to the gloves of the automaton, use the effect making yourself a construct and giving you advantage on your attack rolls, and then take the gloves off, the effect persists through unequipped. You can use the Drake Throat Glaive by throwing one of your weapons onto the floor and then using the Draconic Elemental Weapon to apply a 1d4 of an elemental damage type of your choosing to that weapon. If you have a Sorcerer and you give them the Glaive, they can actually twin spell the Elemental Draconic Weapon ability, allowing you to apply a 1d4 of an elemental damage type to both of your weapons. The Darkfire Shortbow works in the same way as the gloves in giving you a haste that persists through unequipped, although there is some merit to keeping it equipped for the resistances to fire and cold damage. The Spell Crux Amulet has the most value when you use it to restore the highest possible level spell slots you're missing, especially for 5th and 6th level spell slots, of which we have few but that deal the most smite damage. It's a good way to cheat out multiple 5 and 6th level divine smites per long rest. Certainly my favorite part of the video and the video game, the Act 3 gear. For this chapter, I'm not necessarily claiming that this combination of gear is the best possible for Act 3. I mean, there are hundreds of combinations of gear pieces that you could put together in Act 3, and I continue to be amazed to this day by what the community creates and what they put together and the new interactions they find out about. I'm not going on record and saying this is the best, but this is just one variation that I put together that I think works well with all the synergies that I've been explaining and introducing up until this point of the video. To start us off, we have Saravok's Helmet, dropped by Saravok Anchev. We mainly take her for the crit range reduction, but the Dauntless effect is actually super useful as the emotion altering conditions in this game are among the most common. We keep the Cloak of Protection from Act 2, as a plus one to our armor class is still the most relevant benefit we can get from our cape slot, the magnum opus of this build, the Ballist Armor. This can be bought from the e Echo of Abazigal, I want to say after becoming an unholy assassin at the murder tribunal. The Ballas armor grants us the aura of murder, making all enemies within 7 feet vulnerable to piercing damage unless they are resistant or immune to it. And you'd actually be surprised at how little piercing resistance or immunity there is in Act 3 
as opposed to Act 1 and 2. I feel like there's so much more of it in Act 1 and 2. Convenient for us. This will not only double our damage output as our weapons deal piercing damage, but will also double the damage output of any other party member that deals piercing damage. So if you also have an archer on your team, the game is just over actually, and you have won Baldur's Gate 3. For our gloves, we're going to be using the Helldust gloves that drop from Harlip in the House of Hope as they have the most significant impact on our damage of all the other gloves in the game with an additional passive 1d6 fire damage. Keyword passive. There are a few other gloves that might do more damage with relatively difficult to meet conditions. Similar to our cloak, the evasive shoes are still the best use for our boot slot. The plus one to AC is still really nice. We're in act three now and we need our AC to be as high as possible. For our weapons, I'm gonna suggest using both of Orin's daggers, specifically in this order, using the Bloodthirst in your offhand and the Crimson Mischief in your main hand. There's some serious competition for this slot. Cazador's dagger is very strong. Scarlet Remittance is a great source of consistent damage. And you can even justify using the Knife of the Undermountain King for crit range reduction, or even continuing to use the Render of Mind and Body because of our Resonance Stone interaction. But remember that now our enemies are vulnerable to piercing damage, and Crimson Mischief specifically will deal an additional 2 to 8 piercing damage against enemies with below 50% health points and a whopping additional 14 damage when wielded in the main hand when you make attack rolls with advantage, which again, we will always be making attack rolls with advantage because we are either using the Risky Ring or gaining it from other sources like the Gloves of the Automaton. Again, a note to use the Crimson Mischief in your main hand as we already get the offhand ability Crimson Weapon from our two weapon fighting style and the Bloodthirst in our offhand so we get the plus one to our armor class which is a surprisingly nice benefit of using this weapon. For our amulet, we're going to be using the Amulet of Greater Health from the House of Hope. Proceeding the acquisition of this amulet, you should go and respec your character to set your constitution to 8 and tank it completely as the amulet is going to set it to 23 regardless. You can put the points you lost in Constitution or you took away from Constitution into Intelligence and Wisdom. Stat distribution is going to be so evenly spread out and just a really strong character overall. Our ring options remain the same as Act 2 with the Risky Ring being a requirement to activate our Crimson Mischief advantage requirement unless you can gain advantage from another source or another item. And the second slot again is a flex slot. You can use the Conduit Ring, the Caustic Band or the Killer's Sweetheart. For our ranged weapon, we're going to be dropping our hand crossbows in favor of the dead shot, bringing our critical hit range down to 17 with this current setup. And now this build is officially a crit fishing build, critting 20% of the time on one attack made without advantage. In terms of alternatives, the only real piece of gear that has a fierce competition for alternatives are going to be your weapons and your gloves. For your helmet, there's an option to go with the Helmet of Grit. When we're below 50% hit points, we gain another bonus action, which is essentially just going to mean another offhand attack and therefore another smite. You can get this from that one girl, I think her name is Valeria or Victoria, that emits the toxic gas in Kazdor's mansion. It's a really good helmet, it can really increase your damage output. The thing is, it requires you to constantly linger below 50% hit points, which isn't actually as bad as it sounds because our hit point total is so high because of the Amulet of Greater Health. It's something to consider for sure. The Armor of Persistence is your best AC defensive armor piece in the game. It's going to set your AC at 24. I'm also introducing this as an alternative to good karma players who do not want to become an un unholy assassin. The Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength from the House of Hope are really interesting because they allow us to free up our elixir slot. By changing into the Gauntlets of Hill Giant Strength, you can actually consider taking a different elixir, which actually does have a lot of value. Like for example, the Elixir of Bloodlust, refunding an action per kill that we get in a turn. Just for that alone, it's actually worth considering. Although in a vacuum for damage output, the Helldust Gloves paired with the Cloud Giant Strength Elixir is gonna come on top. The Legacy of the Masters sold by Damon are another interesting pick but the plus two bonus to our attack rolls are nice and the plus two bonus to our damage rolls are relatively inconsequential as we should almost never be missing at this point in the game. Martial Exertion Gloves have more one damage Nova potential than the Helldesk Gloves. They're essentially an action surge at the cost of six to 36 health. Health, as I mentioned with the Helmet of Grit, is not as valuable to us as our hit point total is so high because the damage of greater health. This is another great option if you need to do a bunch of damage in one turn. Hello everybody, thank you so much for watching the video. 
It's actually my first time trying to make a long format YouTube video. I'm still in the process of learning. If you liked it and you want to see more, I plan on putting out more content. Please like and subscribe. If you didn't like it and you thought I was just Lord Yapperton, then just dislike the video and please let me know in the comments what I could do better for next time. I'll have some timestamps in the description for each of the chapters as well as links to all of the music I used throughout the video. So yeah, thank you guys so much again.